I've got the flip charts from yesterday, so we can refer to things if you want to. So I wanted to work with you with some very practical skills. These are life skills for shifting our leadership practice. The first one is learning to be here, being present. Very few people are at, live here. Most people are either in replay or rehearsal, either rerunning the horror story of what happened last week or yesterday, or fantasizing and projecting about what's going to happen tomorrow. Do you know this stuff? Yesterday, tomorrow, yesterday, tomorrow, yesterday, tomorrow. What do you miss? Here. Now, will we all taste, taste that? You know, like if you're in a really good conversation with someone, you're present. When you're in love with someone, you're really getting into a great intimate space. You're here. You're not thinking about next week or what happened last year. You're here and now. So we're talking about increasing connectivity and being more effective as a leader. This is the beginning and the end. Get here. Being present, that's the natural state. The other stuff is a story. And it's thought generated. It's the internal dialogue. If you're sitting there wondering, what does he mean by internal dialogue? That stuff. You know the talking in the head? The commentaries? Now, nobody was born with an internal dialogue. It's something we develop, and it's a habit. I've worked exploring people's head spaces for the last 30, 40 years, and it fascinates me. One of the big issues is this habit of being stuck in a story. You get some people who are past focus. They're always back there about what happened before. And then you get other people who are future focused. And some people have a, just a dreadful mix of both. It doesn't matter. Here's the simple answer. Stop it. It's your mind. It will either do what you tell it to or it will just run on its current default. And the default program of an internal dialogue story is simply that, a habit. And how do you change a habit? You stop it. Every time you notice yourself thinking about the past, bring yourself back here. Every time you notice yourself fantasizing and projecting and being somewhere else, bring yourself back here. Bring yourself back into the present. It's actually simple. It's a habit to cultivate. Because you know how to do it if it's important. If there's an intense experience or if someone you really respect, you're right here or someone you really love, you're right here. But everybody else, you just, oh yeah, bye bye, yeah. So, stop the habit. And it's actually simple. I'll show you a, a practice, a drill, as a good way of getting out of the head, because that's the disease of the modern mind. Simply, you can do it right now, just bring your attention fully into your body. You don't have to change your physiology, just where, however you're sitting, just notice how your backside is on the seat, how your feet are on the floor, where your hands are. Just bring all your attention into your physiology and holding your attention in your bodies. Be aware of the sound dimension. There's a hum in the background, there's this voice. Be present to the sounds, be present to your body. Be present to the visual field. Notice what you're seeing. Simply see the feel, feel your body, listen to the sounds. If you want to go further, be aware of the subtle smell in the room or the taste, if only the taste of your own lips. That's called the five senses wide open. It's really ancient, it's two and a half thousand years old at least. Simply bring yourself back. I teach this to people all over the world. They have these senior executives in their computers sitting there, something going zong, present to the body, hearing, feeling the sensations. Just bring yourself back here. See, there are two things, two fixations which keep, pe which keep people stuck in a story. Number one, I like this, I want to hang on to it. Number two, I don't like this, I want to push it away. Do you know that push-pull? That's another thing that keeps people out on the here and now. We're starting, something's happening, we go, oh, this is wonderful, I want to hang on to it. Or, oh, this is horrible, I want to be somewhere else. 
All there is is now. That's the only place reality shows up. We talk about this self-organising, intelligent universe we live in. This self-organising, self-patterning world. It's intelligent. So another way of actually bring, being present is to simply acknowledge everything is happening. And this is it. How extraordinary. Oh, feelings of don't like that. So what? That's interesting, isn't it? This is it. Anyone here ever not sleep? Particularly if you've got something at stake in the morning? And you Anyone? Yeah, all of us, right? So here's a tip. I mean, I've trained myself on all sorts of things. I used to do every trick and technique in the book to... Because like, oh, I've got to get up in the morning, I have a flight at five, I've got to get up at three. Oh dear, I don't want to sleep in, so I'll, I'll start staying up at one o'clock. You know that one? It's madness. So, being present. So I'm lying there and I'm starting to think about, oh, I've got to get up. That's okay. That's just the thoughts running around. It doesn't matter, that's okay. It's just the reactive mind doing its thing. That's okay, that's fine. Simply accepting it, whatever's happening. Oh, I can't sleep. That's all right, nobody died from not sleeping. Let's just be present to what is. Ah, oh, listen to the sounds. Feel the bed. Be present to the experience as it is. Then, funnily enough, next thing you know, the alarm's gone off. You've just fallen asleep. So, being present is one of the keys. Connected with that is listening. Remember, we talked about these bubbles. And with human beings, Is there paper? Yes. Connectivity is more important than content. The most important thing in any interaction is widening the pipe of connection. And one way of doing that is simply being present with another person. Now, I'm sure you've all done listening training, and most of the time it doesn't work. So here's a practical tip to really shift your listening. Stop talking to yourself. It's damn hard to hear what somebody is saying if I'm running a commentary. Do you know that one? I watch so-called people in a group and they're talking and listening. And what someone's doing when they're not speaking is they're rehearsing what they're going to say as soon as they get a moment to jam it in. No listening to anybody else. As soon as you notice the commentary, stop it. Because we're, we're talking about shifting out of the judging mind, being open to complexity. So, listening. Simply be present. And another tip around listening. This is a painful truth. It's a question to ask yourself. Am I interested or interesting? hurt sometimes. Well, that's enough about me. What do you think about me? <laughs> if you want to be effective to shift your listening, get interested, which means energetically put your focus of attention on the other. And so instead of waiting, thinking about, they, you know this thing, and this is a terrible habit most people have. Someone says something and their reactive mind, which is which is just a memory association and he goes, oh, that reminds me of me. You know this thing? I had a heart attack, that's terrible. I had one last year. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's, it's one of the worst things you can do to another human being. You know, you're not respecting them, you just, all it does is activate your own story. As soon as you notice yourself thinking that, stop it. Focus on the other. Now here's another, so first tip around listening, be present. Second tip, shift energetically. Focus on the other. And get interested. Stop being interesting. Third tip, because sometimes it's not so easy to stop the internal dialogue, give it a job. Hang on, what's she really saying? How does this connect with what we're saying before? What's underneath all that? Those sort of, that line of internal dialogue will help you listen more deeply. So, listening. Because in complexity, in, in chaotic situations, in uncertainty, trust is the most important thing in the world. And one way you generate trust is by being present. And another way you generate trust is by listening to people. 
in another way. Um, I can sum this up in two, in two words. Straight talk. Years ago, I used to train chaplains. These are specialist clergy whose job is to go into prisons and into hospitals. This is a high stakes job. In a prison, you've got a minute to show up as a real and authentic or else people just dismiss you. In a hospital situation, if somebody is critically ill, if they're dying, they have no interest in passengers. It's add value or get out of my face. So I had to teach these people how to become incredibly effective rapidly. Basically what we did is we taught them to be straight, to be authentic. And how we did this was as a process called verbatim. For example, if I'm working in a hospital and I'm going to see somebody and they're, they're ill, we'd have a conversation, I'd do my best. Then straight afterwards, the instructions would be to write down the conversation. Then as soon as I got a, a moment to sit down, a quiet moment, to order the conversation by taking a clean page of paper, drawing a line down the middle, and this side writing, I said, she said, I said, she said, I said, she, whatever I can remember of the conversation. Then on this side, to write down any internal dialogue, any feelings, any ideas that were running in me during the conversation, or anything that I noticed. So. Those three are inside my head. This one is in the world. So, how we help these people become really effective communicators was simply this. We'd encourage them to be in touch with what's going on here and to use it. Use the internal dialogue. Use your feelings. Put forward your ideas. Use what you notice. And that's how we help train these people to become incredibly effective. When I started working in the business world, I started to use this in mentoring executives. It's pretty simple, really. Get in touch with the truth that's inside you and use it. Because when we're straight, when we're honest, we become trustworthy. I love that word, trustworthy. Worthy of trust. Now, please hear this. Being straight, being direct does not mean being rude. In fact, it's the opposite. And sociopaths love to get hold of this stuff and use it as an excuse to, be, to legitimize their dreadful behavior. I'm talking about being authentic, not rude or blunt. In fact, the politer you are, the more deep you can be. Because if you're, if you're rude or offensive, you just create reactions, there's no listening to you. So, because when you're straight, you say something and it's useful, it increases your operational intelligence. I mean, who's had this situation? You're in a meeting and you have an idea and you think, ah, no, but I don't say anything. Then a few hours later or a week later, somebody else comes up with the idea and you say, to yourself, yeah, I thought of it. Who's had that experience? All of us, right? So, when you're straight, when you put your ideas up and if they're, they're appreciated, you're listening to yourself more deeply. So it increases operational intelligence. And when you get an organisation that starts to operate, the, operate this way, you have so much more resources available. Now, of course, and I, and remember what I said yesterday, start local. If you want to start to w play with this idea, start with your local team a core group, your direct reports or the team you're in. Make some agreements that we actually, let's be straight with each other. And often people start culturally by beginning a meeting, making an agreement, let's all be more straight. Let's listen to each other, respect each other, let's more, be more direct with each other. And then of course, what happens after somebody tries it determines whether it ever happens again or not. 
I remember I was working in the UK and the boss thought this was a great idea. So he said, come on, just give me some straight feedback. So people said a few things, oh, that was good. Someone else said some complimentary, that was good. And then someone took a risk and said what they really thought. <laughs> boom, boom, any more straight talk? That killed it then. So the tough thing is when you start to implement this, if you're the boss, is staying open when people actually tell you the truth. Because this increases connectivity, makes us trustworthy, increases our intelligence. And of course it's scary stuff, I know. Our fear is we may hurt somebody else, but really underneath that is our fear we might get hurt ourselves. Yet if we're not truthful, we collude together. I'll tell you a quick story. This happened a number of years ago. A young man fell in love with this beautiful young woman. They got married. And while he'd met, met her parents many times, he'd never been to the, the country home, the parents' house. So she said one day, what about we spend the weekend on the farm? I'd like you to show you where I grew up. Now the farm was about 30 k's out of Nanagoon in country Victoria. So anyway, they went there. What a good idea. It was summer in Victoria, which means it was about 42 degrees. It was very hot. They're sitting out in the veranda it's a bit uncomfortable, it's hot, it's a bit slow. And suddenly the father says to his son-in-law, well, son, what about we go into town for lunch? What do you think? Now, intuitively, for no good reason, the young man had a gut feeling that wouldn't be a good idea. But to be a good son-in-law, to be polite, he said, sure, Dad, why not? What do you think, dear? Turning to his wife. Inside, she just went, no, no, no. The food there is horrible. We should stay here. But to be polite, she said, yeah, why not? What do you think, Mum? The mother just about had fits. But she said, well, if you all want to do that, what a good idea. They all got in the car, they drove to Nanagoon. The air conditioner didn't work. It was so hot, the windows were open, the dust caked them. They had a meal that could kill. <laughs> Several hours later, they're back on, around the veranda with indigestion. And to break the awkward silence, the young man said, well, that was good, wasn't it? And his wife said, I knew it would be horrible, I wish we hadn't gone. She, he said, why didn't you say so? I had a feeling it was, we'd better stay here. And the mother said, what? I had the most beautiful salad all prepared. We could have had a lovely lunch. And they all looked at the, the father and said, well, I didn't want to go. I was just making conversation. I didn't think anyone would pick me up on it. <laughs> Four intelligent adults went on a journey no one wanted to go on to eat a meal nobody wanted. You ever been to Nanagu? Yes, you have. You know, you go, what a good idea, boss. Then you go home to your partner and say, you wouldn't believe the rubbish we're doing at work. You know, we collude. We avoid. We collude. Start being more truthful. Straight talk. Okay, so there's two things. I want to talk about purpose. Because that is the secret weapon of powerful teams. And a purpose answers. <laughs> oh, I've got it here already. A purpose answers why. That's the first thing. Now, great leaders start with the why. Because if you want to connect with people at the heart, start with why. Engage people in the why. Because typically we, we enrol people with the what or the how. The why touches people. So it, again, it's a habit. Start cultivating the habit of actually presenting the big picture, why this is important, why we want to do it, why we need you involved. Because pe particularly more introverted types who don't like, particularly like joining group things, a clear sense of purpose is something that will engage them so they can overcome their natural resistance to the group stuff. Purpose is a really important thing because it becomes the thread. I love this purpose that you have. Enriching lives and inspiring a nation. Beautiful. What a statement. What an aspiration. Make it real. Connect that to what we're doing. Clear sense of purpose. Very powerful stuff. A purpose also answers the question, what's in it for me? Remember working in the, one of the big banks in Melbourne. Ah, oh, yeah, we've got a purpose. It was actually a mission. And it was about shareholder value. I said, oh, that'll get me up in the morning. <laughs> the 
purpose has to connect to the person. And part of our job as leaders is to connect each person, to the, connect the thread to their own hearts about why it's important. I think I mentioned yesterday Sir William Hudson, the New Zealander, the Snowy Mountainscape. He had um, 30 different language groups. And it was at 47, just after the sec two years after the end of the Second World War, with all the people who fled Europe, getting as far away as possible. Australia's the end of the earth. And he had former enemies. It was horrible. So he created a purpose, a big picture of what we're doing, building the nation. And then he broke it down into visual pictures. And he drilled that every Monday. He started with that. Powerful stuff. Purpose changes lives. You know that old story of the two bricklayers working and someone says, what are you doing? One says, oh, I'm building a wall. The other says, I'm building a cathedral that's going to be here for thousands of years. They're both building a wall, but one's building it in a different way. Okay, I want to talk about attractor patterns. These are really, this comes from chaos theory. Attractor patterns are energy patterns. They exist in the physical world, they exist in a relational world. Now, they're either patterns, clusters of energy, either positive or negative. To give you a, a metaphor of how they work, I'm sure you've like, been to a national park or something and they've got a 3D model of all the mountains, right? Or if you haven't, you can imagine that sort of thing. And what happens if you got a marble and dropped it down on the mountainside? It would roll down woo, into the valley and, and stick there. And it's very difficult to get it out of that valley and up and into the next valley. That's a metaphor of an attractor pattern. They draw energy and they hold, they entrain energy. Now, they can often be negative, negative cultures. They can also be positive cultures, positive environments. So learning, being astute to attractor patterns and building them. See, purpose can be an attractor pattern. That's where how it can function. When it's working well, it's, it's an energetic field which draws attention. Or a vision can be an attractor pattern, which draws people into a bigger story. Because there's an, a deep human need for meaning. You offer people meaning, that's very fulfilling. Okay. Let's look, come on, let's have some questions. Let's, uh, I'd like to uh, respond to your, your questions, your needs. Yeah, yeah. Um, just having straightforward conversations, to what extent do you think people face the ability to have good sort of communication skills, either amongst or, or prevent that from happening? Yeah, yeah, look, it helps, obviously. And, and uh, one of the things I'd say about this stuff is start to practice it, but don't do it in the big high stakes situations with your big boss or something, or your most important client. Do it with, with friends or do it with your work colleagues. Just start to practice the habit. And again, it's about being polite and respectful, and partly it's t tonality. And you know, some something was like, oh, look, I don't want to offend, but forgive me if I'm wrong here. But I just have a sense that when you, when you, were, when you were saying this, that it didn't seem to ring true to me. So can I ask you what's behind that? Yeah, you know, I'm just making something up. You know, being respectful, being polite, with a soft tonality, and just practice. Practice in, in with your peer group. Practice getting more straight with each other, because like anything else, it's a habit. And I know it violates the culture. But you know, I've worked in about 30 countries around the world, and every place I work says, "Oh no, no, we don't do that here." But look, I've created microcultures. Uh, countercultures in China and in Japan, you know, and they go straight talk, <laughs> and you know, like they can be, you know, like it just takes some practice and some trust. Yet it builds really healthy environments. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think one of the first things is modelling what you want. Like, it's really easy to fix everyone else up. 
because the problems are always out there, aren't they? You know, I'm all right, it's just you people. You know. So, I mean, so the first thing I'd say is grow yourself, develop yourself, and model what you want. That's one thing. The second thing is um, being straight with people. And again, you say, look, you know, I want to have a, a good conversation, but it just seems like, you know, you're not listening. You're just, just yeah, yeah, at me. So please, can we just slow it down? So I think, I think partly it's, it's part of the answer is our own modelling. Partly I think it's about um, practising being more direct with them. And they're so tricky, aren't they? Because you, you, can, you can be misunderstood so easily in a text or an email because there's, there's no subtext there. Uh, and the thing about face-to-face -face is you, you, you know, you're getting all, the, all the, the, the visual cues and the auditory cues and the physical, you know, all that stuff. Look, it's, it's tricky. I think we need to have, take more care. I'm sure you're right. I know I used to listen to, because uh, I'd worked with international companies and they'd be holding conference calls you know, with people around the world. And you'd hear this, tack, 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 you know, because of, yeah, 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 right, yep. They're doing emails at the same time, it's just rubbish. So I would, I would actually attempt to create some ground rules. And again, this thing about creating, uh, creating energetic spaces, create some, a few simple rules like, hang on, we just stay present with each other. We stay here. We don't look at the screen, we just stay with the one thing. Then you increase the quality of the conversation. I remember some years ago I was working in China and the client was in Stockholm, Shanghai, Stockholm. And the medium of conversation was English. So we had Chinglish and Swinglish. The opportunities for error were extraordinary plus all the cultural misunderstandings. Now, I couldn't do anything about the people at the other end of the phone. So I suggested that I taught them some basic listening skills and I taught them some basic inquiry skills and one of the things I taught them was simply just paraphrase. And it was a little mechanical, but it worked. It reduced error incredibly. So it was like, help me here. Uh, you said da, 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 and, and it seems that of the three things, number one is the most important, is that correct? So that was just, and again, that's working still with auditory conversations. But you're quite right. I think we have not developed protocols anywhere that I know of around emails and text. And I've got this predictive text that just, if I'm not careful, it's just, it, you know, like, whoa, that really is my unconscious. <laughs> I'm sorry, just rephrase it again. Um, what, what advice would you have for an organisation that's virtually hierarchical yep. that might have more than the decision making at the top? Yep. Um, and they want to capture um, I guess some some balance and yep. develop leaders throughout the organisation. Yep. It's tricky. I'm not saying this is easy. One thing is about being courageous. And I love that word courage because it's connected to the French word for heart, cool. So it's about being big hearted. And if you have an agreement with your boss, if they espouse wanting to be more collaborative and their, their pattern behaviour is dropping back into command and control, then you're halfway there because if you can get an agreement to give them feedback in a respectful way and to help them retrain, it's not a simple thing. I know when I work in the organisations, I like to work top down, and I probably spend about 70% of the time with the senior team, because most of the problems are between their ears. And then when I get them sorted, the people are usually pretty good. You know. 
and uh, then the change can happen rapidly. And of course, I'll spend, say, say if I spend three or four weeks with the senior team, then I'll do a one-day workshop with the team. And I've got the senior team for weeks practicing what I've been teaching them. And, and I love it. Everywhere they say, has our management done this training? <laughs> and of course, you know, it takes time to change things. It's not easy. But if there's good intent, it's a lot easier. And of course, one of the things is that people drop into their default patterns when they're anxious or threatened. And command and control is so, so reassuring. You know? So I don't have a simple answer. But I think being courageous, being straight, and making some agreements to help them change can be really useful. And also, again, modelling. And another thing connected with modelling is transparency. Because we tend to pop out with outputs. Transparency is going, hang on, this is, my re this is why I'm saying this. This is my reasoning. Again, the why. Unpacking my reasoning for why I'm saying such and such. That reduces error incredibly because often our reasoning is faulty. And the output we've come out with is actually based on an unclear, woolly thinking. Exposing our thinking, exposing our reasoning, exposing why we're saying something really changes things. So like with your boss saying, look, I'm really, I know you, you, you talk about wanting to be more collaborative. I think that's really important. I, I'm passionate about it. So why I'm wanting to keep bringing this up is because of da-da-da-da-da, because I think we can be more, you know, whatever it is. So your own transparency could help you. So it's not like you're being rude or being a smarty or something. It's just that you have a deep compassion for changing the way we do business. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's about being congruent. It's about being you know, truthful over time. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, totally agree with you. Yeah. And of course, one of the things um, is um, if you're actually in any leadership position and you want to actually improve your own straight talk, tell your team and then invite them to pick you up every time you slip. I love doing that because suddenly I've got free coaches. <laughs> because, you know, habits are habits. And we all sleep in our unconsciousness, but if I've got, and people love to bust you, you know. So it's a fabulous way of ex accelerating your own development, inviting your people to actually give you feedback whenever you actually violate, violate the behaviours that you are trying to grow into. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a deep question. Look, yeah, no, no, it's fabulous. Yeah, look, um, to answer it in a big way, um, I make a distinction between horizontal development and vertical development, because most training and development we do is horizontal. That we expand our repertoire, learn new skills, new, learn new techniques. Yet it doesn't really touch the core of our being. Vertical development is about shifting our consciousness which is about exposing our blind spots being exposed, which is about changing our wiring. Now, that's hard work. And, you know, like a lot of people work at a behavioural level, and it does something to a certain extent, but it doesn't shift core things. You know, and I've worked with people that um, they're really good at smile training, and they learn the techniques. And they do it enough and they can gain the habit, yet it hasn't touched the core. So they actually come across as really untrustworthy because this, you're getting this double thing. So I found that um, whenever I work in an organisation, I work mainly with the top first, and it's group work and confidential one-on-ones, you know, deep mentoring. You know. So you can do a certain amount at the behavioural level but the real stuff comes out of a deep, committed, almost therapeutic relationship. Yeah. So, um, yeah. 
but it's no easy fix. But I think it's I think it's the most important journey in the world is to actually grow ourselves as a person. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that relationships trump content uh, every time, and I don't disagree with that about that. But can you talk about the value of quality content living in this world of social media yeah. to create those networks at a community level and, and the role that great content can play in terms of creating that connection? Oh, absolutely. Look, and I think um, the classic example is the US military. That um, I, I touched on this yesterday. That. They, they realised that they had to actually increase relationship connectivity, it was one thing. They had to have an overarching purpose. And the third thing, which is the very thing you're talking about, was providing high quality content easily available to everyone. So that they shifted the, the collective intelligence of their organisation by pushing the, in, the, the information lower down and decentralising it. I, w I, I wonder sometimes if, like, Snowden was an unexpected consequence of that. Because suddenly someone relatively low level was able to access a whole lot of information. So, absolutely, if you want to build community, one way of building community is to have high quality content and make it available and easily accessible. Because it, it helps change conversations. Yeah. If you had a question, what would it be? There's no point asking, uh, having a great one on the way home. <laughs> uh, attractive patterns? Yeah, I missed. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. The energy fields either positive or negative. They can exist in physical locations, like in a home, often the kitchen. Or often I go into a workplace and where people, where people congregate is like in the calf. That, that's a simple example. They can also exist as big ideas, like a vision can be an attractive pattern. It's something that's important and it draws attention and it, it attracts people and holds them. So like a vision that's alive, which means it's reinforced and, and constantly repeated and built, um, becomes an attractive pattern because it guides things. And like a, hmm? yeah, yes, pulls it. and like a purpose. So when you have a clear sense of purpose, you can make informed decisions. It's like, I have a personal person, purpose. My life's about growing people. So because I've got a clear sense of purpose, any job that comes my way, it's binary. Will this help me fulfill my purpose? Is this an opportunity to actually help grow people? Yes, fabulous. Or no, this is just helping people sell stuff, don't wanna know. So in that sense, a purpose is an attractive pattern. They can be a physical space. And the thing about them is they entrainment, they catch, capture people. And see, like a negative culture can be that. Or you can have a really destructive person, a destructive person who's just, they're like the rotten apple. You know, they're an attractive pattern. They just draw the negativity towards them. You got it? Yeah, thanks. Now, feelings are extraordinary things. Now, it depends on our type, firstly. Some, ty some types of people, they can just switch. Yeah, over that, got it. Other people, when their feelings are awakened, it runs for hours. Yeah. Feelings are important. I remember one of my teachers used to say, feelings are valid data too. 
to me, I think, you know, one aspect of it is honouring them. I've helped change organisations just on a gut feel. When I've been sitting in a meeting and just, I just get the sense that something's not right, we're avoiding something, and I've actually just expressed, you know, I don't know what, what's going on here really, but I just get this sense, I get this gut feel, da da da, whatever it is. So actually giving voice to the feeling has actually changed the meeting and changed the organisation, you know, the smallest thing. So one aspect of, uh, I'm, I'm about honouring the feelings. Because they're a powerful, a powerful source of data. Then the, another side of that is like not being run by them. So I'm speaking in a paradoxical way here. Because there's not a simple answer. You know, you get people who just like rage, anger. It's just like a red, red filter over everything. That's not really a really healthy place to be for themselves or, any, or the people they're around. Because they're not seeing it for other people, they're just seeing their story. Does that start to touch that? Yeah, yeah, just um, just trying to realize that from a behavioral perspective. Hmm. And so involved and just um, rational thinking is like not just stopping. Yeah. And from a logical mind. Yeah. You have to say you stop there, sorry, but it, no, it doesn't work. So so another thing with emotions, because they're embodied, is shift your body, shift your physiology. Like uh, if I'm actually having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who's really depressed, you know, and they're looking down and uh, one of the first things I would do is let's go for a walk. By changing the physiology, changing their embodiment, the feeling will change. So, yes, it, thoughts are easier to deal with, but feelings often just shifting the physiology would do, would, changes it. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, Thank you.